I'm Stephanie. And I'm Rachel. And this is Neurodivergent Voices, the podcast amplifying the voices and lived experience of the neurodivergent community. We're licensed occupational therapists who specialize in the brain and are neurodivergent ourselves. Join us every so often in this podcast that is for you and by you, the neurodivergent community. If you're interested in learning more about neurodiversity and joining a vibrant community of neuro-inclusive adults, head to our website, divergecommunity.com. Interested in an interview? Email divergecs at gmail.com to get it scheduled. Let's get to it. In this special episode, we share live interviews from participants of this year's ADA celebration with the Disability Network of Washtenaw, Monroe, and Livingston County. This year, 2024, marked 34 years since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Before sharing the interviews, I'd like to spend some time setting the stage, both the historical one of the passage of the ADA, but also the present one, this celebration. The Americans with Disabilities Act, abbreviated ADA, is a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in everyday activities. The ADA prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability, just as other civil rights laws prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, national origin, age, and religion. The ADA guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else to enjoy employment opportunities, purchase goods and services, and participate in state and local government programs. But what does disability mean? Well, the ADA defines a person with a disability by meeting at least one of the three following definitions. The first is that the person has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. These life activities are further described as actions like eating, sleeping, speaking, and breathing, movements like walking, standing, lifting, and bending, cognitive functions like thinking and concentrating, sensory functions like seeing and hearing, tasks like working, reading, learning, and communicating, and the operation of major bodily functions like circulation, reproduction, and that of individual organs. The second definition is that the person has a history or record of such an impairment, such as cancer that is in remission, or that person is perceived by others as having such an impairment, such as a person who has scars from a severe burn. So if a person falls in any of these three categories, the ADA will protect them. So what exactly does the ADA do? Well, the ADA is broken up into five different sections, which are called titles. So different titles set out the requirements for different kinds of organizations. So Title I has to do with employment, and this applies to any employer that has 15 or more employees, including state and local government, employment agencies, and labor unions. This title says that employers must provide people with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from employment-related opportunities available to others. So this includes things like recruitment, hiring, promotions, training, pay, and social activities. Title II is about state and local governments. So state and local governments must provide people with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from all of their programs, services, and activities. Title III is about public transit. Public transit systems must provide people with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from their services. Title IV is about businesses that are open to the public. So businesses must provide people with disabilities an equal opportunity to access the goods or services they offer. And finally, Title V, telecommunications. Telephone companies must provide services to allow callers with hearing and speech difficulties to communicate. The ADA was originally drafted in 1986, and the bill didn't get signed into law until 1990, after dedicated advocacy and lobbying efforts, as well as a profound demonstration of inaccessibility by protesters on March 12, 1990. 
Over 1,000 people marched from the White House to the U.S. Capitol to demand that Congress pass the Americans with Disabilities Act. When they got to the Capitol, about 60 of them cast aside their wheelchairs and other mobility aids and crawled up all 100 Capitol steps. This became known as the Capitol Crawl, which was a physical demonstration of how inaccessible architecture impacts people with disabilities. Just a few months later, it was signed into law by George H.W. Bush. 34 years later, in 2024, the impact of the ADA is apparent, both through physical modifications and through the existence of services like the Disability Network, who hosted this community-wide celebration we attended. That being said, despite this important step in legislative progress, Discrimination on the basis of ability, also known as ableism, is still very much alive in American society, which excludes individuals from fully participating in meaningful activities to this day. Physical spaces and laws may have changed, but it takes much more to change minds. The ADA celebration was a demonstration of progress. The interviews will share scream that progress, but will also touch on the barriers that remain. Around 200 community members of all abilities and their families joined in music, free food, tie-dye, celebration of art and shared journeys, and learned of local organizations also supporting the disabled community. We were honored as one of those organizations to be asked back for a second year to share neurodivergent pride through our conversations and interviews with participants. Stephanie and I both wore bright t-shirts, which we made, that were decorated boldly in the words, proudly neurodivergent. So many party goers praised the shirts and asked for one for themselves, which was a loud testament to the turning attitudes towards neurological, mental health, and developmental differences. All of the following interviews were from brave party goers who volunteered to share on the spot. They're vulnerable, they're honest, they're raw, and I hope you enjoy. Listen in. Hello, we are here at the ADA 34th celebration here with the Disability Network of Washtenaw, Monroe, and Livingston County. And we are joined today with... Krista Kohler. Yay! Hi, Krista. You are our first uh, interviewee for today, so thank you so Mm. much for taking on that honorable role okay so our first question for you is do you identify as neurodivergent and if so would you share why yes I have LD ADD um, and um, so yeah that all qualifies me <laughs> can you can you define what LD ADD is LD is learning disabilities Um, I have problems with spelling and um, other stuff. Um, I have dyslexic moments. Uh, Sure, okay. I have those often. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, yeah. Okay, and then ADD, I think most people know. Yeah, it's attention deficit disorder. You can't sit still. (laughs) Sure. Or you can't focus or your brain goes way too fast. Or it's or it's way too unorganized to do anything. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, what does neurodiversity or being neurodivergent mean to you? Um, it means that I have a unique view on the world through the lens of my disability, mm. and that I see that the way people um, are different gives them a u- unique view of the world than anyone else. Yeah because of their experiences, not just experiences, but how their brain functions, how they function. Um, Do they enjoy reading? Do they enjoy blah, blah, blah? Just like the innate characteristics Mm -hmm. that we've been programmed with. Mm -hmm. Um, And... um, Yeah, no, I think that's that's beautiful. beautiful. And it's such a profound and I don't know if positive is the right word, but like positive way to view what society hasn't always 
seen mm -hmm. in that light, right? And so I'm, I'm grateful for people like you and us, right, mm -hmm. who are showing, hey, wait a minute, it's a beautiful thing to be neurodivergent, mm -hmm. and here's why. So on that note, what are some things that make you uniquely you? Things that you're really good at, things you enjoy doing? Um, really good at art. Um, yes. I have some yes. <laughs> art, art uh, stuff here that I have made. Um, in the gallery. In the gallery. Yeah, they're gorgeous pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're uh, three, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> four, <laughs> four watercolor <laughs> and one sunflower, like multimedia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find that um, I very that um, um, that everyone has a unique view, and that we should find it and be and discover ourselves and be. Um, be identify yourself and through that be the unique you that you are to shine the light to others mm. love it that was beautifully put it was would you mind kind of sorry this is off script but i think it would be so impactful if you could share a little bit about the sunflower artwork that you did here mm -hmm. and kind of what the inspiration was behind it. Obviously people can't see it, so could yeah. you give like a little visual description of it? Okay, so it's um, paper, like like a paper sculpture with three sunflowers, big sunflowers, and then three crane flowers, which I mean crane flower means that I made the crane and then I made um, I, and then I put it all in a circle so that it becomes a sunflower. So the crane flower is made up of all different pieces and parts mm -hmm. and people and gifts and knowledge and fun mm -hmm. that everyone builds on some, something for, for other people. Like we're all a puzzle piece of someone's life. Ooh, yeah. And that we want to share our unique gift to others as much as we can so we can make up smile mm -hmm. and so that um, we can show that they have worth and value and that um, they have a way to donate to the world in any way they can even if it's just a little thing yeah. that the little things can be very profound mm -hmm. and um, and and involve giving in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so in your in your art piece, you kind of have more like traditional looking sunflowers mm -hmm. and you also have some that like you said have all those different colors and textures mm -hmm. and materials. And then you also have one that you use to represent like hidden disabilities. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how you showed that? Um, they're all, um, all, all the, almost all of the sunflowers are a pretty gold flower. It's pretty gold, <laughs> sorry, Crane. Yeah. And then only one of them is, um, of a different, I made of a different, um, because I had, um, I had different, um, textured papers, mm -hmm. like photograph paper for origami. And so I did, I don't remember what it was, but I did something that matched the color, but had differences in it. Yeah. That you have to look closely to mm -hmm. see that this is different. Yeah. And then I did one of each of the different pictures for diversity because we're all different. We all have our gifts mm. and our struggles and we can help others with struggles. And that, um, being you is just a gift. Yeah, yeah. I think that was such a clever way to demonstrate that it's not always obvious mm -hmm. what people are going through inside, and it's not always obvious when someone's neurodivergent or you know disabled in a way that isn't physically apparent. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just so beautifully represented in your painting. I'm wondering, 
and you can totally say no, but I think it could be really powerful if in the show notes of this episode we had a picture yeah. of your sunflower so people can kind of visualize mm-hmm. it. Yeah, about. there's a link to all. Oh, yes. There's a virtual link. Perfect. To all of the art. Okay. We'll so other that. artists can talk about their art. Mm-hmm. Really nice. Really nice. All right, so to kind of wrap up, because I know you have uh, a skit coming up very soon, mm-hmm. which we're going to hold you for, but what would you say is one thing that you wish more people understood about neurodiversity or about being neurodivergent? That being different is okay. That, yeah. that being different, being you, finding who you are and being you is perfect. Mm. That is the one thing the world needs the most. And that is the one thing we need to give ourselves mm. and give to others. Well, Krista, you are such a beautiful advocate for all human beings, but especially for those with disabilities. And we, we thank you for the advocacy work that you do in our community. And we're just so lucky to get to know you. And then one last thing is there yeah. was one um, that I chose, like the one that was stood out from any other was there's a crane flower of be, be, knowing who you are and being who you are. So it's like this mm. pretty color that just stands out from the gold. Nice. Knowing who you are and being who you are. Mm-hmm. Those are both, you know, really challenging things, mm. I think, for people to do. So thank you for giving them the courage. I think that's possible and to do that. Well, thank you so much, Krista. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. I always clap. I don't know. It just feels worthy of clapping. You did a great job. Did you make the crane earrings you're wearing? No, I didn't. I was going to say, those are tiny and immaculate. I can can make tiny ones. Can you really? At least I could in the past. All right, Colin. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> My Still bad. the thunder. <laughs> I know. So do you want to introduce yourself before I steal your thunder? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, go ahead. My name is Colin Northwood. Mm-hmm. And I do technically identify as neurodivergent. My primary disability is cerebral palsy, but, but I do have some technically because of the disability, I have some other learning disabilities come with it. So I okay. guess you could classify me as neurodivergent. Okay. And um, how it makes me unique is um, I have a really strong auditory memory. So if you mm. tell me something, it'll be locked away in my brain for years and I have, I have great memory recall and retrieval. Okay. Um, so you gave me a little sneak peek that you have a podcast. Does that help when you have a good memory retrieval for your podcast that's all about sports? Yeah, especially <laughs> when you're in, when you're researching questions or or like even you can do all, you can do all the prep work in the world and sometimes the most unexpected things pop up that you may not have even expected to prepare. Okay. So um, that what makes me is what makes me unique, I feel. Um, some other hobbies and interests include uh, I've been performing music for over a year, so that's kind of fun. And What kind of music? Uh, mostly keyboard. Nice. Um, those kind of things. And, uh, I do I do fitness activities like cardio drumming. Ooh, okay. So that's always fun. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my other interesting hobby includes model model train like. Mm, like making the model train. Like running them. Running them. Okay. Where would you do that? I have. A st- I have a spot in my basement for it, but Perfect. we haven't quite set it up yet, but okay. eventually that's the idea. Fair. And, uh, um, I have a service dog and I do general church activities in my church okay. club that way. Cool. Um, it's really sort of helped me cope as I've grown up, it's sort of discovering things about myself and my related handicaps. Okay. Sure. 
at the church or with your service dog specifically? Both. Both? Um, he was the first, he's the first dog I've had. So it's like, I always, I always equate it to like, like if you know any people who are parents and they take home their first kid from the hospital, they kind of had that feeling. It's like, it's like, it's like, now what do we do? Because all of a sudden, in my, my case, you had this dog, and all we had before was experience with cats. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, a whole new world. That's a big difference. <laughs> but it's been, it's been helpful in a lot of ways for me and my family. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I've had a good support team, too. It's not just my mom and dad and my little brother, but mm -hmm. various people that have come to assist me over the years mm -hmm. so that in a nutshell makes me okay is there anything specifically you want people to know about neurodiversity well when it comes to neurodiversity don't ever assume just because somebody, for instance, appears to be uh, limited verbally or non-verbally in some cases, doesn't mean that they're intelligent or that they can understand what's going on around them, mm -hmm. even if they can't physically tell you what's yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. They can express themselves in ways that are unique to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this idea of presuming competence in everyone you meet, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, so you mentioned your podcast, but you didn't mention it by name, and I want to make sure we get a shout out to your podcast for uh, those look, interested. If you're interested in my own podcast, it's the CNR Sports Armchair Interviews on Spotify as well as Apple Podcasts. Okay. Um, there should be new content coming up this fall. Yay! So I have some ideas. Okay. Uh, it's been on the back burner for a while because of mostly the music thing, but okay. I always have ideas percolating mm -hmm. in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. So that is that. Amazing, amazing. Um, so. I think that was, are we missing any of the questions we said? I think those were the main I'm trying to remember what that one was. I don't know. I, I wrote down, what do I? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's not. I'm trying to read her handwriting and it's oh, not working out. What do you wish more people understood about neurodiversity? Oh, that's basically yeah. what you asked. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, so one thing I just wanted to comment on. So when you, when you first were describing whether or not you identify as neurodivergent and you said that, you know, well, I have cerebral palsy. That in of itself, a lot of people would classify as being neurodivergent, right? It's it's a way in which your brain functions differently, and for some people that's from birth, for some people that's an acquired thing, and for some people it's both, right? right. So you can be multiply neurodivergent, like a lot of us are, and it sounds like maybe that's that's what makes you uniquely you too, is your multi multiplicity. Yeah, we are all. It, it, it's just a, it's just a way, it's just the way I'm thought about my handicap. Yeah. Because I always think of it as like I always think of it as like physical. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I hope it's you know, a, a positive thing for you to kind of explore and think about um, this idea of neurodiversity because we think that it is something to celebrate and it's something that adds a lot of uh, distinct value to the world. So, yeah. no two brains being alike is a, is a good thing. Hence the shirts. Proudly <laughs> neurodivergent. <laughs> Proud of it. Yeah. Well, we thank you, Colin, for joining our podcast and oh, you're welcome. about Absolutely. your podcast too. Maybe one day you'll interview us. I don't know if I got much to add on sports, but if you do I like to say I don't know much about sports, but I'm interested in sports. That's about it. <laughs> but know. maybe if you talk about the White Sox or Blackhawks, I know we're in Michigan, but if you talk about those two teams someday, yeah. I'll join on. <laughs> also, um, your shirt is a good reminder to register to vote if you haven't already done so. And to use your power, right? Right. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. <laughs> um, no matter what side you happen to fall on the issues, I always think it's important to vote. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Colin. Thank you so much.
beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna pause it. Okay. Okay, do we have a treat for you guys? We have someone, a wonderful someone who we got to interview last year and their name is Gray. And if you don't remember Gray, I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to our episode from last year. They started out our episode and we have some serious updates from Gray. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's so wonderful to be back and to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to see you too. And I'd like to personally apologize that it took me 11 yeah. months to publish our last <laughs> interview. <laughs> and I hope That's you don't okay. hate me forever, but oh, of here we not. are. It's, <laughs> okay. it's the neurodivergent tax. Thank you. <laughs> I totally understand. It is, it is. But you know what? It was a beautiful episode and we got around to it. Yeah. That's what matters. I'll listen to it and be like... Oh, that's what I said. I'm, I'm so curious to see when you listen back to it, if some of your opinions and thoughts on it have, have changed, or if you're like, I still have that. Because it's kind of an evolution, getting to know yeah, yourself. I, and... I don't, I have no clue what I said last year, so. Okay, well, I recently listened to it, and one thing that you shared quite a bit about was like what your, your strengths were and your interests, mm -hmm. and you shared about your journey with writing. Oh, yeah. And I asked, do you think you're ever going to share any of your writings? I'd love to right. read it. And you're like, at this point, no, but maybe in the future. Yeah, well, so <laughs> that happened, <laughs> kind Yay! of. Um, it wasn't the novel that I was planning on or the short story, but one day I was sick and tired of the ableism fa that I was facing in my workplace. And... Uh, I had I had been working on a little bit of a disability comic before, but I was just so enraged by all this ableism happening that I just decided to pick it back up and basically, uh, you know, pick up where I left off, basically. Mm. Um, so it's called Obnoxiously Anoxic. It has a cartoon of a brain with the little wrinkles and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, bleeding mm. and it's saying I can't breathe. Um, that's because, I don't know if you know, but I have an anoxic brain injury from losing two thirds of my blood at birth. Mm. Um, and it caused uh, memory impairment. So that's... That's my story. Uh, it starts with uh, the ADA, what, which we are celebrating today, uh, of 1990. Um, has a couple definitions of it, uh, of disability, including the Netherlands. The, so first it's the American definition, the Dutch definition. The Dutch definition actually uh, intrigued me because it says um, a person with a disability is described as being anyone who is able to work at the Dutch labor market but who will not survive without government support. Oh, what? So, huh. yeah. And now, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. That includes seeing, hearing, learning, or eating. Uh, and the ADA's definition includes individuals who have a record of such an impairment. Um, Proof. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you make of that difference? I, I think it's so cool that you, you kind of compared and contrast the two there. I think it's interesting because I, I am, yes, able to work. I am, I think I'm doing stuff without government support. I'm not on Medicaid or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't be disabled in the Dutch, in, in the Netherlands, which I think is interesting. I'm like on on the bubble with the 80. Nobody believes I'm I'm I, I have a disability. 
even my bosses. More on that later. <laughs> maybe off. Maybe off. Yeah. The off record. Later. Yeah. Off the record. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so it goes on to have uh, the India's definition of a disability, which is very specific. Um, it uh, a disability is categorized into seven categories as of 1995, and then edited to include four more, so 11 uh, specific disabilities in 1999. The categories are blindness, blindness, low vision, leprosy cured, hearing impairment, locomotor disability, mental retardation, and mental illness. Wow. In 1999, the definition was edited to include autism, cerebral palsy, uh, and apparently mental retardation is there twice. I don't know what, what that's about. And multiple disabilities. I have a few questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blindness, low vision, that... I mean, it's not the same, obviously, but... It falls under that umbrella. Vision related. Disorder. Vision related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leprosy cured. That's a what, very. What is written? Uh, that is in 1995. Yeah. And also, there's like different countries had different outbreaks of leprosy. Yeah. Way more intensity than. But like, I, it's I not just a normal it was, thing we hear about here. Right. I just thought it was interesting. Wow. Um. And it was. Just and the when it when the last one multiple disabilities does that just mean like all like the cat pick two from right. the categories or does that mm -hmm. is that's it, it. you like only get to pick from this area exactly yeah. that's yeah. interesting yeah, it seems very limiting yeah it feels like there's kinda. a lot that's not not being touched so much, and but. and yeah. the ADA's mm -hmm. definition is very broad mm -hmm. and I think the cultural differences or the the maybe uh, I don't know just the difference between the the two and how different people and different places etc how they view disability yeah. um is different mm -hmm, you know that's sure. interesting mm -hmm. which segues into uh, as a disabled per person, I prefer to see abilities and disabilities as some sort of a garden. Mm. Like, there's one flower here that's autistic. There's a tree here that has ADHD. There's a bush that's blind. Mm. Uh, everyone's different, and different is, is cool. Different is beautiful, mm -hmm. <laughs> is my corny joke. Why o u t i f u l Yes, exactly. Uh, and then I have a very poorly drawn depictions of different disabilities. Um, so poorly that I have to include in parentheses what the disabilities are. Hey, it's but, accessibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're giving captions. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. It's subtitles to the art. Yeah. Um, how, how we got on time. You're good. We're good on time. The only thing is, I promised someone I'd see the skit at five. Yep. Okay. So I'm wondering, do Should we you pause? guys want to keep going oh, and yeah. I'll go see it? Yeah, that works. Or do you want to pause? Oh. Uh, I'll watch it. Uh, uh, keep going? Keep going. Okay. I'll be yeah. back. I'm so right. sorry. No, That's you're fine. good. Give extra applause for us. I will. I will. <laughs> You're doing cool. All right. So the next page is kind of uh, another uh, part, part two, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's a quote. So I was I was at a zine workshop at the library one day. Okay. And I was like, I don't know what to expect, but this will be cool anyway. And there were a bunch of like magazines and old books all around, so okay. I got this idea. Uh, and a couple things stood out to me. This quote being, uh, this this quote, which is, I relate to people who are somewhat damaged. Don't ask me who said it. 
I did not look. It was not disability related uh, for, I don't know why it, well, anyway. I think it's still a relevant quote though, especially for what exactly. you're trying to represent. And then it's, but are you damaged or are you art? And um, this, this is a bowl with uh, k- kintsugi. I am probably butchering that. Okay. It is the Benin's okay. uh, practice of if you break with the gold, the right? gold, yes. Yeah. If you break something, you glue it together with gold glue. Mm-hmm. So it's not broken but it still shows its history mm-hmm. which i think is quite cool yeah and almost makes it more valuable too exactly right? it does it shows it. that it's unique in some exact fashion so that was my idea behind that um then i go into my disability story uh tr- content warning blood Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. So if you don't like vague descriptions of blood or infant death, uh, stop stop listening right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I have my curly-haired glasses self just being like, Hi, I'm Gray. I'm mm-hmm. the creator. When I was born, I was very sick. I have a picture of a baby hooked up to an IV. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was born at St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital, but was taken in an ambulance to Mott Children's Hospital. Um, I got an, I always stumble upon this word, (laughs) anoxic brain injury from losing two thirds of my blood. Now in this, I was like, I I thought I was clever. And (laughs) I drew a little brain and um it's got little dro- blood droplets coming from the brain yep and each blood drop well so the brain is saying i can't breathe and each blood droplet is saying different things first one is you'll never catch me alive sucker <laughs> the, the second one is we're actually getting away with it <laughs> and the third one is like i don't know what i'm doing i'm just following these guys <laughs> bystander effect um, so, do you want to explain what happens when you lose blood in your brain? Uh, so, blood carries oxygen. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, um, if you, like, have too tight of a sock or something on, and you ever get, like, that, that kind of purpley, like, almost, like, going blue, purple, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's your blood, like, leaving your body and getting, leaving that area and getting not oxygenated mm-hmm. very well. Mm-hmm. So, blood carries, the red blood cells carry oxygen. Yep. Um, and if you lose two-thirds of your blood, you'll probably die. I, obviously I didn't, but that was because sheer luck. Mm-hmm. Um, my doctor's told my parents that I would probably not make it. I was on a ventilator. I was in the hospital for 17 days. Um, And next page says, but my parents didn't give up. It has a picture of, looks kind of like a gay Humpty Dumpty. A little bit. Um, That was meant to be, (laughs) I, this is kind of like a, and, and, it, an internalized ableism thing. This is really hard for me to talk about mm-hmm. with my disability from being teased all my life. Well, I'm, I mean, up until like 18. Anyway, 18. Um, so I said, my parents didn't give up. They're pushing Humpty Dumpty me. You can tell it's me because it's rainbow. <laughs> I love um, it. Thank you. Um, so then this is like your parents. My parents okay. and, and my therapists and everyone. Mm-hmm. But I also later thought this, the person could be me and Humpty Dumpty could be like other people's assumptions of what I can and can't do. Mostly can, 
they people look at me and think, oh, yes, a neurotypical. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I r drew this, I created this in part to let my peers know that uh, I have a disability, gosh darn it. Uh, I know you don't think I do, but I do. I'm a, I'm a little butthurt about it. Anyway, uh, they, my parents were determined to give me the best help I could get. Um, I have a lot of self-esteem issues regarding my disability due to being teased. So I, I drew this big frankenstein -y monster with big teeth. Uh, he's wearing a shirt that says, Hi, my name is Internalized Ableism. And he's saying, I'm coming to get you. And he's got the furry eyebrows. Yep, that the, are just... the grumpy eyebrows and <laughs> big vampire teeth. Mm -hmm. And I'm running away. And I'm thinking, don't let the bad thoughts win. Because if they win, I... You know, that's not great. And then I kind of define... Well, not defined, but I explain internalized ableism uh, as like a shark, you know? You never know when it's going to come up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, it, it's, the shark is the voice in your head that just tells you, you know, I have this disability and I suck because of it. Don't let that shark win. Do not let it tear you apart. Yeah. I also like, though, how you kind of described it, that it comes up out of nowhere sometimes. Yes. You can be working on it for years, mm -hmm. and there's still going to be times, which happens for pretty much everyone, yeah. where the internalized ableism just comes out of nowhere, and you don't even realize it yep. sometimes. And, like, I should be able to do this. I should be able to do that. Why can't I do this? Other people are able to do that. And then I just kind of have to, like tap myself and be like, dude, <laughs> exhibit birth. You're yeah. you're bad you're you're a badass. Mm -hmm. Feel free to edit that cuss word out. <laughs> um, it's it's an adult podcast, so Okay, cool. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I kinda go on to say, why be proud of your disability? Like why if if I were being ableist, I would say, why would you, content warning ableism, why would you be proud of a deficit? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it changes your perspective, It give, and it gives you strengths that other people don't even have to think about. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, I have a lot of problems with, like, spatial memory, so I... I notice all of these things, mm -hmm. like, okay, I have to walk 10 steps, and then I see the fire hydrant, mm -hmm. or something, and the fire hydrant is diagonal from where I want to be. Mm -hmm. I have to think about that, and, and, mm -hmm. um, it, it just, it's different. Yeah. Uh, and so if, if you're constantly battling your disability, you're not going to get very far. I, I always kind of twitch at the, um, at the idea of fighting or, or bat battling a disability because it's not a bad thing. The world says it's... I'm talking to my, chi my inner child here. It's mm -hmm. not a bad thing. And anyone else who's listening who's currently like, mm -hmm. I'm disabled, I, I, I can't do it. Yeah. You can, and... And it's also not saying that the disability isn't there. Like, right. Like, the disability is still there, but it doesn't make it any less different for how you can live yourself in the world, or, I guess different's not the word. It is different. It is different. It I doesn't, think, it's not less. There we go, that's the word I'm looking for. It's different, not, not less. Yeah, exactly. Um... 
you know, you're you're unique. Um, so be proud. And what does that look like? It means educating others like I'm doing, participating in events mm -hmm. uh, like the ADA celebration and, and um, s support groups and things, advocating for yourself, um, or really anything, anything you want it to be. Just do, like, whatever inspires you to be, ooh, um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, That'll whatever, happen. whatever makes you happy, do it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, you being you is a gift. Mm -hmm. Um, and just remember that. Can you turn the page? Yeah. Sorry, we have a broken fidget, so if you hear random noises and stuff, that's what that is. <laughs> uh, and then I was thinking, oh, my disability is so invisible, I'm like a spy. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my next part of the my zine thing. Mm -hmm. um, having a, I'm a spy in a non-disabled world. And I'm a dandelion in a field of tulips. And, you know, I really thought about it, whether I should say roses because, or, or a weed or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, but I just thought of dandelions because kids will give you a dandelion and say, look at this pretty flower. And you're like, an adult would be like, that's kind of a weed and, you know, uh, but you, even though you're a dandelion, you're, you're still pretty. Um, but it can feel definitely like you're the odd one out. Do you want me to get you a wipe? Yes, please. I was going to say, I think I have some. Uh... It's, it's being a stripeless zebra in a field of horses and wondering why you feel so different. There's like something in your gut that tells you one of these things is not like the others and that thing is me. Um, it's knowing that the line between abled and disabled is fine and blurry. I don't care who you are, your life can change in an instant, and you can go from being neurotypical, um, able body, do we say? Uh, with, you, you can go from like point A to point B in two minutes, exactly. two seconds. Yeah. Um, I mean, it just takes one accident yep. to happen to change how your brain works. Yep. To change how your brain or your body works. Mm -hmm. and, um, let me flip the page. Yep. Um, and, um, with that, um, you, I kind of have to say... I am valid, I am enough, I am super gray. <laughs> and there's a little picture of gray in a superhero cape, just kind of flying through the sky. Uh, and I define justice, it's a noun. The quality of being fair and reasonable. Um, and I have the new and improved <laughs> Justice League. Also called the Disablists, there is a service dog, a social worker, um, like a person in a wheelchair that drawn the best of my ability, which is not that great, but gets the point across. And me, the curly-haired kid, <laughs> starring Gray, <laughs> superpower, invis ability to be invisible and blend in with the neurotypicals. I was asked by a neurotypical 
obviously, to define neurotypical. So I have it. Neurotypical, adjective, not displaying or characterized by autistic or other neurologically atypical patterns of thought or behavior. So yay, I'm invisible and I blend in. But wait, it is not I the one one person is saying wait and then another person is saying it is not a disabled person's job to cater to ableists. I have a little definition of ableism. It's a noun. Discrimination in favor of able bodied people. So why blend in when you were born to stand out? And uh there is a little bit of, I, f I, a little tangent here. Yeah. Um, there is, I've noticed there's a tendency for people with physical disabilities calling themselves a certain word. I'm not sure if I could use that word. I was told by several different people that it was okay. I think um, if you are told by the individual who is experiencing it that it's okay for you to use it, then okay. that's fine. Okay. I, I figured I just wanted to put it out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, a service dog is saying. So there's, there's like this little bat signal thing, and mm -hmm. it has the... Uh, person in the wheelchair kind of accessible mm -hmm. it no it is the old-fashioned one because mm -hmm. I could not figure out how to draw the new the new one, it's, one. It's kind I of love hard. it I love it but I could not figure out how to draw it I have pages and pages of just scribbled out <laughs> anyway <laughs> and uh, the dog saying what's this a crip signal disablists unite and then I have me and the dog and a person who uses a wheelchair all putting their hands in and I'm saying blue skidoo we can too Woo. and I like how you have a little paw print yes for the dog thank you uh and we're going back in time to 2002 uh to kindergarten gym class with me so I say hello five-year-old gray what seems to be the problem and five-year-old Gray says, my gym teacher sends me to the principal every day because of my disability. So I punched the gym teacher. Reasonable. <laughs> and that ends this um, segment of mm -hmm. Obnoxiously Anoxic. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go into it if you don't want to, but oh. do you want to explain kind of that last page? Yes. So much. Uh, I, in... In kindergarten, I had a gym teacher who had this really weird... Apparently, um, we had spots on the floor that we were supposed to go... We were assigned a different spot each day mm -hmm. that, that we were supposed to go to in between games and exercises and stuff. And... For the life of me, I could not remember where that spot was. It changed every day. How are you supposed to do it? Um, Especially when we're having member, memory difficulties. Exactly. How do you expect a five-year-old kid with a brain injury to, to figure that out? Um, and the gym teacher wasn't hearing any of it. Uh, she sent me to the principal's office every day. I would burst into tears, go to the principal's office, be like, I don't know what I did wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm i still angry about it 22 years later um, because, like, really, really. Um, yeah, trying to explain to a five-year-old what their societal supposed like expectations right. and, why, and trying to understand their own brain and general. my parents were like my mom specifically was like 
like email the teacher, talk to the teacher. I don't even know. I was five and I have a memory impairment. But mm -hmm. she said, you know, I talked to the teacher and I I tried to explain, but she would not under like she would not listen. She was just mm -hmm. it was like really difficult. And she and yeah. Uh, I'm sorry that you went through that. Thank you. It's traumatizing. <laughs> Understandable. Um, having several learning disabilities and stuff and teachers not really realizing it. Oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, you could read all these things, you know, and being yep. very dyslexic and it's yeah. stuff along those lines or memory difficulties with yeah. um, tu brain tumors and stuff. Yeah. So it's teachers going, oh, like you should know these things. And yep. <laughs> You're trying to explain, uh, that's, I, my brain literally has a tumor right where I'm supposed to remember this stuff, yep. so I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard to be that person, you yeah. know, and trying to explain to someone else that isn't in your own shoes and isn't willing to yeah. kind of put themselves in your shoes. Yep, exactly. So... I'm super proud of you. Thank you. For just listening to your story, because I wasn't here last year, but listening to your story on kind of wanting to share this concept mm -hmm. of kind of like a superhero justice league, basically, yeah. around um, disability, and you actually putting it into a physical, like I'm holding it, there's a physical piece of work right in front of me, which is amazing. Yeah, she's thick. She's she's very thick. And you said there's more pages, technically? Yeah, I have a whole sketchbook full of them. Okay. So it's going to be a part two next year? Is it going to be like a several, like a comic book? You know, how there's... Probably. Unit one, unit two? Probably. Okay. I'm excited to see what the next units are, then. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you kind of want to tell people about for neurodiversity or, like, where they can find potentially this artwork? Uh, see me after class <laughs> if you wanna if you want this artwork <laughs> and pay money. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, one thing that I cannot stress enough is just be kind to people. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know how hard they're trying. I know I. My mom says I'm the hardest worker she's ever met. And I kind of agree with her, <laughs> not to toot my own horn. Um, but like, you don't know what people have going on. Don't judge the the person who's quote obviously able to walk for. I don't know, sitting in the front of the bus. Mm -hmm. Don't judge someone for asking a million questions or the same question over and over. Uh, just be... Assume best intentions, I guess. Yeah. Agreed. Don't you ever call me lazy, I will come to your house. I'm just kidding. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I don't know if we're kidding too much. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, <laughs> for legal don't reasons, we're yeah. kidding. <laughs> yes. Dun, don't dun, call dun. me lazy. Fair. Well, I don't think a lazy person could do all this work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you kind of coming back on the podcast, round two, yeah. and showing your creative work actually in physical form because it's one thing to hear about it but to actually see it is another thing i appreciate it thank you thanks gray and i'm sorry for taking so long oh you're good you're good okay uh could you go ahead and introduce yourself my name is ted kohler and i'm 45 years old and i am on the i'm neurodivergent uh on the autism spectrum and um i've been trying to work hard on getting my Independence. Rachel's been helping me with achieving my goals, so it's it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. So it's, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you um, identify as neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. What does being neurodivergent mean to you? That this is a relatively new term for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm always I always heard the word autism and autism spectrum, and so it, it's it's I guess it's a more broad umbrella now than yeah. it was. So so it's I don't really have a thought about it, to be honest with you. Okay. But
but I think that keyword is important, broad. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. So whereas before, it maybe it was a more um, like specific or characteristics too, too or diagnosis. Because um, in the past, with autism, there's a lot of people didn't really understand. Um, they, it, 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 they always think there's classic autism and there's, they, they, that's what, I didn't yeah. fit, the, fit the profile of that. So. Yeah, quote unquote classic yeah, yeah. autism, right? It was like a very kind of narrow, yes, very, narrow yeah. stereotype. And you felt like you didn't fit that. No. So, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what were you what were you diagnosed with originally? Uh, it wasn't okay. autism spectrum disorder. No, it wasn't. Yeah. It's was PDD-NOS. Okay, what does that mean? Um, pervasive developmental disorder, now that we're specified. Oh, and okay. I I think that it did, because that's because the, it goes back to the whole autism thing. I didn't fit quite fit the autism spec. I mean, the, what they understood at the time. Yeah. And um, it so it, it, that's what they put me on because it wasn't it was kind of other but I wasn't fading, fading, I still was, I was really high functioning. I see. So, okay. So it wasn't yeah like fitting the narrow stereotype. Yeah. Did that that name ever change for you? Yeah. Um, Obviously, you're saying autism spectrum. Yeah, they now, eventually so. well, some t high, must have been went to ADD, LD. Okay. First, and then I think it went middle maybe middle school high school. Well, middle school, I think was all. Okay. I okay. Did, did you ever fit, I know for kind of a short period of time, they were diagnosing like Asperger's syndrome. Is that ever something you identified with? I think or? it was more in the mid, I, I always thought it was Asperger, but I had speech delay, so I'm not sure if that would fit. I see, okay. Because I did have speech delay, so. Yeah. Well, I thank you for sharing that, because I think it's interesting for folks that, you know, grew up knowing they were autistic, mm -hmm and for folks that are receiving diagnoses mm -hmm. later in life, mm -hmm. have like a different journey around yeah, it, right? Yeah. Not just in what we call oh. it, but also in the, like cultural perception yeah. and mm -hmm. like how that kind of shapes yeah. our identity of who especially we when are. You're from, especially from Hollywood, like the, the, yeah, the stereotypes yeah. of autism. I mean, I'm gonna tell you, I hate to bring bang, bang, bing bag theory and Sheldon up, but, but, but that's the most stereotypical version. They, they claim it's not autism, but it's, it, yeah, it is. So, yeah, so it's yeah. like either you're he's very either you're so rigid and you're it's kind of not quite that. There's um, some difficulties with change and stuff, but I'm not as rigid. But as Sheldon's like super uber rigid. Yeah. Well, and that's honestly a, a big motivator for why we started Neurodivergent mm -hmm. Voices is mm -hmm. because we felt mm -hmm. as well that there was such a narrow perception of what people thought of when they thought of autism when they thought of neurodiversity in general mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like we're here breaking that down because there is no one look there is no uh mm -hmm. classically neurodivergent classically yeah. autistic like it's it's not it's like even for if i've seen examples of this where either this is like another there was a sci-fi show that there was a character with autism and the character with autism was di di displayed oh sorry i'm just kind of no you're good display, you're great. was displayed as uh, having no emotion not able to commit not to show it can, couldn't show love it couldn't show emotions mm. of any type it was very and, and, and that's not how i yeah. think things so Right. I think that's another yeah. kind of harmful mm -hmm. and more stereotypical yeah. uh, stereotype that people had is yep. that autistic people don't feel empathy, which yeah. we've, not we personally, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. that has been strongly yeah. disproved. Mm -hmm. But getting common folk to understand and accept that is, is different yep. than scientifically we know that's not true and, yep. and lived experience we know that's not true mm -hmm. in fact a lot of us experience really really hyper intense, <laughs> intense yeah. empathy yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes our empathy just looks different like just, cognitive versus emotional and feeling it versus yeah, understanding it it can be a little more intense depends on yeah but it's, it's really hard to describe though yeah for sure so if you were talking to someone who I don't know was new to the world mm -hmm. of neurodiversity What's something you mm. kind of wish you could tell them or wish they would understand? The, even though you have this, it doesn't define who you are. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's, it, it, it just, it, it depends on who, what they have and, I'm trying to think, sorry. I'm just yeah, sorry. and who they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yep. So, what defines you? Like, what are some <clears throat> things that make you uniquely you? I'm very good at directions. Yeah. <laughs> I like maps. When I was a little, I would read maps. 
I would argue you still love maps. Um, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still do. No, yeah. Still right. good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I um, actually, interesting enough, I used to be scared of dogs. Now I love dogs. I little, didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, the, the dogs would jump up, and this, this is like a small poodle at the Boy Scout, the Cub Scouts. They had this little poodle that would jump up, and I was scared of it. But um, now I love dogs, so I got a puppy with Hans, his first dog. So yeah. I was gonna say you show Cheyenne off all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so good at uh, like maps, good at directions. Oh, like Japan. Other I've traveled to Japan. Okay. Three times. World traveler. World traveler gave sp- speeches in Tokyo. And really? Shikasaki. In yep. English? Yes. Well, I had, trans- I had a translator. That's cool. I, they, I had it in Japanese. Miss Suzuki did it in Japanese. but. Um, what did you do in Japan? Why were you there? I was, the first trip, I was, there's three different trips. So the first trip I was doing study abroad. No, no, it's not abroad. It was um, a tour. It was a trip with the Student Association of Eastern Michigan. So it was oh, like okay. a sightseeing trip. Mm-hmm. Second trip was, a, I did a research, I got a grant to do a research project on autism in Japan. And I got to see a place that was called Kiaku no Sato. So they have like um, they have a place where they have a Vogue, the Vogue department and stuff. Uh, Higashi School, which is in Boston too, where they don't do like special ed and stuff. They mix it, they keep it together when they're a very young age. So there's no, you know, there's a. So that's what I did. I read it. I did a PowerPoint on that. If I can. So, so I did a PowerPoint, and uh, the third trip, I actually really fought for this one because I wanted to study abroad in Japan. So I got a grant, and so, sort of through Social Security, that allowed me to save money and um, for a goal. And was, so I got, I talked, I stayed with my family, my friends over there in Japan, and they had a house over there I could stay at. So I was there for three, stayed there three months. Um, needless to say, the class, the school I went to, was not the best school in the world. I was probably the first person with a disability there. Okay. I was like, um, it was. Um, very interesting because they, they said you know a lot of kanji because I'm very, very, very visual but auditory processing is a little difficult. Yeah. So they asked me you can answer, you can look out you know about kanji but you don't know how to answer question right away that's what they told me. Mm-hmm. Well I mean they, they have this it's, it's a lot complicated but for three months I dealt with that. If I gave up I would have to go back home. Mm. So I stayed stuck with it. <clears throat> Ended up with the worst teacher possible there who was freaking out every time I made a mistake. She was just visibly showing them like Frustration, and I'm going. I was, I, I, after three, under three hours, I was very polite enough, yeah. but I kind of broke. There, there's a rule in Japan: don't talk to, about your teachers, or you don't talk back to your teachers, or yeah. trust your authority. So I said, um, I'm a special learner. Please respect that. She got up, she left the room. She was really pissed off. I didn't. Re- she didn't say anything. She just left, and she was kind of, and I, and I was kind of like mortified because I never had a teacher do that to me before. So, but wow. I stuck together for three, three months. That's amazing. So not only are you a world traveler, but all the traveling that you were doing was like kind of advocacy thrown into it too, bringing awareness to, mm-hmm. to your unique experience in the world. My friend and I, we went to um, uh, Aikida, Northern Japan. Okay. So. We're very, very cool. Well, Ted, we are mm-hmm. so grateful that you took some time out of this Thank wonderful you. celebration today mm-hmm. to talk a little bit about yourself mm-hmm. and, and Thank you. your experience. Yep. And I wish for you lots of future travel yep, yep. and good maps mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> that'll help good you get map. around yep. in new places. And uh, yeah, thank you, Ted. Yep, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> All right, so we have Krista back for part two of an interview. Krista is joined today by Shalanda. Welcome, Shalanda. We're so glad to have you guys together. Yeah. So, uh, we just had the opportunity to watch these two wonderful humans uh, present a skit at the ADA celebration. And I don't want to take away uh, their, still their thunder, but they wanted to provide kind of a little uh, overview of what their skit was about and why it was so important for today, the ADA birthday. Take it away, ladies. <laughs> Well, I think it's really important for um, people to understand that there are people that have disabilities that are invisible or non-apparent. And um, just because a person has a non-apparent disability, it doesn't mean that they are not enough um, a part of that community, a part of the community. And they should, they should, they shouldn't be 
judged for their lack of being able to show and point to um, a physical disability, you know. Um, so the doors, friendships, and disabilities, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey through two people meeting each other regularly in life and passing each other and finding out that they have a disability and that they both submit it to the same gallery and come to find out what each other's challenges were in life and so I was really glad that Krista asked me to participate with her and we came up with this skit. Amazing. Yeah, um, and I just, well, I'm going to steal if you like. Yeah. I just want to get my, the view of my world out um, that I always just want to make people smile like everyone's my friend, you know. I just want to bring the sunshine to others and know that they can have a friend. <laughs> they can do this. They can walk through life. They're not just able, they're just differently abled. Mm -hmm. That they have other abilities that they can they can fall on. Mm -hmm. Especially things like art, you know? We express ourselves through art. Mm -hmm. Such a powerful communication mode to be able to express and then connect with others mm -hmm. through that expression of art and understanding. And I love that both of you in your art pieces, which um, Krista shared a little bit about her art piece earlier. Would you mind sharing a little bit about what your art piece look like? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you want. Only if you want. Um, mine is just um, this woman with a pill bottle, an empty pill bottle in front of her, and next to her is a syringe with a plant emerging from it. And next to the syringe is words, actually, that make up the tree. And they've been smeared but they say things like family god roots run deep um friendship uh god is love they say all these different words and then at the top it says non-compliance and it's been etched out and so during the stage of non-compliance um through going through uh, mental health through my mental health journey um these are the things that I leaned on for support more so than just holistic healing, but of uh, the unspoken things that the unseen behind the scenes, like my family and, and that was supportive as well. So those are the things that are etched out in the picture that you can't tell that are words, but they are words there that make up a, a tree. Hidden so, meetings. Hidden meetings, yes. Yes. There's a lot of hidden meaning behind our skit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for opening the door to Fresh and Hey, it swings both ways. We support each other. Yes. Man. That word that you use, non compliance, it's a heavy it's a heavy word that we hear a lot in the world of neurodiversity and, and mental illness and I'm kind of curious how you chose, if you, if you, whatever, you don't have to share, of course, how you chose to have that be a part of your artwork. Um, because it was such an important part of the process <laughs> that every time I felt unheard, I was labeled non-compliant, and so my it's my way of saying i i don't want to say rebelling and saying hey but it is my way of rebelling and saying non-compliant does not mean that i'm not a part of i'm not an active participant in my healing journey of my mental illness it just means that hey i need you i need an advocate i need some kind of advocate advocacy and i did find advocacy in in almost like god's gifts you know, advocacy and like the 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 places you wouldn't think more so than just family. But I had to learn how to advocate for myself and um, and really um, and really take the reins, you know, and say, hey, this isn't working. And then other advocates came in and said, said, stood up for me too and said the same, finding that support. And then that's when I leaned into 
alternative medicine and went to school and got my degree and associate's degree in it. So it, it, it all served its purpose to get me to where I am today. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, thank you for asking. I'm thinking about non-compliance. Like, so I work as an occupational therapist, and when we were in school, that was like a frequent word that was tossed around. Like, mm -hmm. the client was non-compliant. Mm -hmm. And now I'm really thinking about, what does that really mean to be non-compliant? And that, to me, feels like it being unheard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How you're describing it too. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's this choice, this behavioral thing. Maybe sometimes the choice is to be heard and to advocate for yourself. Yeah. But to be non compliant means something isn't working and exactly. someone's not hearing you. So exactly. thank you for communicating that and having a little aha moment for me too. That's um, yeah. 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 Words carry power, meaning, you know, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. They do. You guys are incredible. I love <laughs> these kinds of conversations where we can just be fully transparent in who we are and to celebrate that, not just share our light to others. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I think that's the greatest gift, you know, we can give to this world is shining our lights back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and you two obviously shine very bright. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for sharing your skin with us mm -hmm. today. Yes. And I wish you a beautiful rest of your day and weekend. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. you did so great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Neurodivergent Voices. Interested in an interview? Email divergecs at gmail.com to get it scheduled.